This is the first Sunday of Lent this year. What are you giving up for Lent? I'm going to give up coffee. Take up tea instead. No, not actually. I don't think that would work out well for me. Besides, it would ruin the ethos of this channel. Actually, what I would like to give up this year is having my heart rhythm drop into arrhythmia and then having to go to the hospital. That would be great, but unfortunately out of my control. I haven't given you many updates on that front lately, but I've had a really good run of beautiful heart rhythm for about six weeks in a row now, and it has been absolutely fantastic. Let's see if I can make it through Lent. Lent is the season in the liturgical year that focuses on preparing our lives for Easter through prayer, self-denial, and repentance. So why is Lent 40 days long? Well, this is taken from the 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness fasting and undergoing temptation. That's the easy answer. But it all depends on which church tradition you're from and how you count to 40. Seems simple enough, but it isn't. Western churches tend to start the countdown on Ash Wednesday. Then, just to confuse the issue a little bit more, some denominations end Lent on Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter. Others end it at sundown on Holy Saturday, the Saturday before Easter. And then finally, just to add another layer to this whole mathematical puzzle about how to count up to 40, some churches exclude Sundays from Lent, giving you a bit of a respite from your Lenten disciplines. This week's lectionary reading is taken from Luke chapter 4. This and Matthew's account of Jesus' temptation are the two foundational accounts that form the basis for Lent. So, it's only fitting that we examine them at the very start of this season. Before we jump into Luke chapter 4 and look at the temptations, we need to have a little bit of context. The story that sets up the temptations is Jesus' baptism in Luke 3, 21 through 22. This reads as follows. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Immediately after this, Luke dives into an extended genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam. And each generation is introduced by the line, the son of. In this way, the baptism and the genealogy, Luke is showing us that Jesus is the son of God. Let's take a moment and now read our passage for the lectionary reading this week. Luke 4, 1-13, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version today. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. All too often when we interpret the temptations today, we do it from our perspective. Actually, that's not quite true. We do it all the time. What's really hard to do is going back and asking, what would Luke's original readers have seen in the temptations? For them, there are a couple of big questions that needed to be answered about their faith. And these are accusations that were brought against the church by both the Jewish and the Greco-Roman communities. First question was, was Jesus a worker of magic? 
Did he do tricks to win followers? Second, is our faith in Jesus a new or a different religion, or does it stand in continuity with Judaism? Number three, did Jesus or the apostles teach us to worship another God besides Yahweh? To a large extent, the temptations address these accusations. So let's take a look at the temptations. At the very start, in verse 1, we have a couple of interesting clues. First off, we are told that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. If you remember the video on Jesus' presentation and the purification of Mary that was done in the temple, I'll uh, link to that video over here. I mentioned how Simeon was led by the Holy Spirit. Luke mentions this three times in three verses in 2, 25 through 27. Now, at the very start of Jesus' ministry, Luke tells us that Jesus, too, is led by the Spirit, just like these godly Jewish worshipers in the temple. Into the wilderness. This phrase here is talking about the Judean desert. It lies between the Judean highlands, where Jerusalem is, and the Dead Sea. It's about 75 miles long and about 10 miles wide. It's extremely rugged with cliffs and is very rocky and receives very, very little water. It's a desert. Food and water are only available at the bottom along the Jordan River Valley or along the Dead Sea or in the highlands up by Jerusalem. Luke's reference to both the wilderness and the 40 days also evoke allusions to Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And that is something that is echoed throughout this passage as well. Where are my manners? I forgot to introduce myself. My name is David Paris. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible if you're new here. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other institutions around the world for the past 20 to 30 years and to bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please take a moment and do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, hit that little share button and let somebody else know about it. Thank you very, very much. With that as background, let's look at the first temptation, turning stone into bread. The first thing that would have come to mind for Luke's readers would have been street magicians. A trick like turning stone into bread would have been something that they would have done in the marketplace to captivate a crowd during that day. So in a sense, Jesus' refusal is also a message that he was not a magician. Craig Keener in the Inner Varsity New Testament Background Commentary writes, that the devil's first test of Jesus is the sort of feat ancient thought attributed to magicians who claim to be able to transform themselves into animals and to transform other substances like stones into bread. Second, the devil is asking Jesus to perform a miracle similar to God did for Israel in the wilderness, providing them with manna. In this way, then, the first temptation stands in contrast to Israel's failure in the wilderness. They ate the manna, and then they rebelled against God. Jesus has fasted, but he will not rebel, and he will not turn a stone into bread. And his reply is from Deuteronomy. In fact, all three of his replies to these temptations are taken from the book of Deuteronomy. The first response is from Deuteronomy 8.3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus does not meet his appetite by turning this stone into bread. Rather, he quotes from the law of Moses. By doing so, he shows his dependence on and obedience to God. Second temptation, all the kingdoms of the world. One of the central teachings in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts concerns the kingdom of God, something which Jesus' whole life looks forward to and is introduced with his death and resurrection. This temptation introduces this rich theme of God's kingdom in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. The idea of sonship, though, is not mentioned specifically within this temptation. However, the idea of giving the nations of the world to God's heir is from Psalm 2 and is linked with the idea of being called God's son. Psalm 2, verse 7. I will tell of the degree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now, some see this temptation as a temptation to a political messiahship. Jesus would become the Davidic king that would rule the world. 
Leading up to the New Testament and during the time of the New Testament, there was a stream of thought within Judaism that thought that Yahweh was the sovereign God, but the world was in rebellion against him and the devil had usurped God's role to influence human hearts and cultures. The book of Daniel is perhaps the best example of this in the Bible. Even though Daniel teaches that the world is in rebellion against God, he emphasizes that God was still sovereign and in charge. There's another problem with this. The world and the nations within it are not the devils to give away. Psalm 2 explicitly teaches that God owns the nations of the world and they are his to give to his heir and whom he chooses. The big problem here is that the devil is offering what is not his to give and is already Jesus' rightful inheritance. Once again, Jesus' reply is from Deuteronomy. This time he quotes from Deuteronomy 6, Moses' sermon, where he warns Israel not to commit idolatry. Deuteronomy 6.13 And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, this temptation reveals that Jesus is not starting a new religion or to worship a different God. He stands squarely in the middle of the Jewish faith. We are to worship Yahweh and to serve him only. Third temptation. Throw yourself down from the temple. This temptation is the most difficult to explain. It has no parallels in the Bible. And this time, the devil is basing his temptation on Psalm 91. Now, this temptation strikes at God's promises in the Old Testament that he would protect his children, especially when they are worshiping in the temple. We see this in Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 37, and 91. The devil is misquoting, though, Psalm 91, which is the reading from the Psalms for this week as well. So let me read a portion from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, and then uh, let's go 9 through 12. Verse 1. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. This passage in Psalm 91 is all about God's protection for his people. And the line the devil quotes is a hyperbole, an overstatement meant to show how comprehensive God's concern about you is. As you walk about in all your ways, you will not even stub your toe upon a stone. God watches over us so that even when we place our next step, that is watched by him. There's been a great deal of speculation about what this pinnacle of the temple is. Was it the top of the temple building itself, or a top of one of the temple gates, or a place along the outer wall overlooking a sort of a valley? We don't know. All we know is that some point in the temple, or the temple compound, is being referenced here. And it appears to be a high enough height that if Jesus were to cast himself off it, he would probably most likely die. Now, this temptation is probably meant to short-circuit God's plan for when Jesus would reveal himself as the Messiah. By throwing himself off the temple and being saved before he hits the ground, this would have attracted a lot of attention and would have proven his Messiahship to these people. This idea is also seen in John chapter 7, where the brothers of Jesus tempt him to reveal himself at the Feast of the Booths in the temple. They say to him, why don't you go up to Jerusalem and declare yourself the Messiah? Once again, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy, this time 6.16. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, the Greek verb here behind test is something that conveys not just attempting to prove something to be true, but it also has a lot of negative connotations to it. To tempt someone, to try and entrap someone or the other person, or to entice something that they know is wrong by offering them a reward, sort of a quid pro quo type thing. By misquoting Psalm 91, the devil is trying to get Jesus to entrap God in sort of a promise that should not be fulfilled. If you are his son, he will protect you if you do this, won't he? After his third failure to tempt Jesus, the devil departs for a more opportune time in verse 13. 
Most likely, this is an oblique reference to the crucifixion that will come later in Luke's Gospel. The story of the temptation is loaded with theological themes and ideas. A lot of these were addressed to the needs of the early church. First, the temptations answered several big questions that confronted the early church. Jesus was not a magician. He was not starting a new religion, but stood in line with the teachings of Moses. And he was not telling us he was a different or a new God. He was dependent on and obedient to Yahweh. Second, the temptation set up a theme that we're going to see repeated in all four Gospels. Jesus will not prove himself by signs. Third, notice how Jesus doesn't respond to the temptations by sucking up his guts. I can handle this. Get away from me. Or what we could say is a first-person response. I am not going to do that. Instead, he replies in the third person. That is not what God's word says. Jesus saw himself as a servant of God and works within the framework of the Old Testament scriptures. And he also gives us a model that we can follow when we are tempted. We don't suck up our guts and fortify ourselves. Rather, we trust God's word and we are obedient to it. Finally, the temptations show that Jesus endured temptations far beyond what we will ever face, and he remained faithful to God throughout them all. As such, he is the Savior that we can trust in. We can imitate his faith and his obedience to God. I will leave it there for this week. Remember to give it a thumbs up, share these videos, and subscribe. Until next week, peace.